You know, our industry is unlike any others in many aspects, but it's very similar to almost all industries in the fact that we have to deal with salespeople. You guys as travelers have to deal with salespeople. And you've got great ones, but ones that aren't so great. That's just the way it is in our world. Unfortunately, throw another wrinkle in it with people that are brand new in our industry. Ones that are guiding you and giving you, get this, career advice. We're going to talk about new recruiters on today's episode of Travel Evolved. This is Travel Evolved. I'm Mark Holloway. Welcome to the episode, everybody. Uh, I, I don't know if this is a good episode or just an, a tough one. It's a little of both. Um, it should be very informative. It should be quite eye-opening for many of you. You know, again, I'll, I'll start this off and I'm going to digress and, and do some cool things we've been talking about doing here a little bit, but let me qualify this episode. You guys know I am not trying to beat up specific people that are in our industry that happen to be recruiters. I'm sorry. They're just very good people that do this, and there's some people that aren't so great. Like any other industry, it's not unique to healthcare. Not every recruiter is an awesome person, and certainly not every recruiter is out to get you. And sometimes I think you guys fall into one of those different schools of thought that everyone's wonderful or everyone's out to get you. The fact is, people are people, as they say. Everyone has good and bad recruiters, <clears throat> just the way in the nature of the industry. I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about that. However, I am going to tell you that this episode kind of goes along with things we've been talking about lately in that it is unfortunate that you are putting your career and your, your at least potentially your next assignment in the hands of one or a handful of people that barely know you and you're trusting that they know what they're doing. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today's episode, how you'd be surprised that the overwhelming majority of them don't. Or the overwhelming majority of them have not been doing this for very, very long. We're going to talk about some things that may surprise you, some real statistics from our industry. So, I mean, it's, it's like I say, it's a tough one because I feel, I feel bad about doing this episode. But it is, it is absolutely part of Travel Evolve. You can't get away from it. There's no way to sugarcoat this. I'll, I'll say repeatedly through this episode, they're good people, they're good people. But the fact is, again... You're dealing with a sales aspect, and you are the commodity. Make zero mistake about that. And gaining your employment makes people on the other end of the phone, at the end of the text, on the other end of the direct message, all the different ways you communicate with them, it makes them money. And it is you who decides who makes that money, what agency makes the money, and what recruiter, more specifically, is going to have a little tiny slice of what that agency is making. It's all about money. And unfortunately... There's no way around that right now in our industry. Well, there is a way around it, but when you're dealing with a recruiter model, there isn't. It, it just, it's just the way it goes. So we're going to talk a lot today about recruiters who are brand new. And like it or not, there is, there is a challenge for them, which then means a potential cost to you. Again, there's no way to sit there. I'm not beating up every brand new recruiter. There's, listen, some very good people, but... <laughs> This is an industry that it takes some time to get good at your craft. So those recruiters that have been doing this for a long time are going to love me after this episode because they should be rising to the top of the pile. And in all honesty, they've earned that right, and they should be. It's the brand new ones, the ones that, again, you've got to have your guard up. And unfortunately, they're more common than the ones that are really, really good and have been around for a while. Just part of our churn and burn mentality, the revolving door that is, in fact, travel health care in, in, you know, in now in 2023 and has been for a long time. So any rate, first and foremost, thank you guys again for tuning in to us. I, you know, I, I'm just very, very happy 
that we are moving into the third episode. Uh, yeah, it's getting a little tough to get these things knocked out. You know, Next Gen Med staff has gotten busier. I said I came out here and, and meant to uh, specifically to handle some things that have, you know, taken us by surprise. I've got my own learning curve with this particular company that I've never experienced before. I'll talk a little bit about that, I think, today. It's, it's unique. I mean, all of us have our learning curves. You guys do as travelers. Recruiters, we're going to talk certainly about it today, have a huge learning curve when it comes to understanding how to best help you. And there you go. And then, of course, like I said, I, I'm, I'm, I, it's ironic and not surprisingly, and I knew this was coming, that we're having our own learning curve because this company is so different. And the growth aspect has taken some of us by surprise, me, myself, and um, it's causing some things I've never had to deal with in this industry, which is good and bad. It's good because we're growing. It's bad because it's hard to anticipate those. So um, it's it's all it's all good in the big, long scheme of things. So learning curves are, are what they are, and you guys have to go through your own. I'm just admitting I'm going through mine right now, too, which is fun. Hopefully, I'll get through it faster and better, and that's the way it goes. So, All right, let's go back to recruiting. <sighs> Here's what I'm going to tell you. It's difficult to become a good recruiter in our industry. It really is. A couple things at play there. One of them is for the average recruiter, and again, average, 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 it is not a position that many people will have for their entire career. Listen, there are some recruiters that make really solid money. Um, they work five days a week. They get to leave their business mostly at, at the office when they leave. It's a good gig. But for a lot of people, the compensation plan for a recruiter isn't what they want and dream and aspire to have for the rest of their of their lives. It just is what it is. They, again, that being said, there are recruiters that make crazy money and wouldn't do anything different. But again, I'm speaking in averages and I'm speaking in, in general terms here today. It's a great second, third, sometimes even first job you have. There will be a point where many recruiters are looking for more. And that's when you see some of those spinoffs of companies where they decide to form their own company or they do something different. It is especially with, you know, with inflation, the cost of living right now, it is hard for someone to say, I'm going to be a recruiter for 25, 30 years. There are a few, and I think those few make very, very good money, or they're in a situation where it really works well for them for their personal financial um, you know, reasons and what it works. But for the most part, it is not typically a career you know, from beginning to end type of, uh, of, a, of a position, of a career, so to speak. So it's hard to get through that realm. When, when you get really good at something, you want typically more. You've earned that right to have more, and recruiting is no different. They, recruiters who make really good money tend to want to make more, and they start realizing as, they, as time goes by how little of that slice of their own pie, of the company's margin, so to speak, is actually going to them. And they're making that company a ton of money. And most of them start to get a little frustrated saying, wait a minute, I'm doing all the heavy lifting, and you know, you may be floating the money and everything else. It was your idea, but I, I want more. And that's oftentimes what happens. And if you'll notice, and you guys have seen around our industry for the last 20 years, that's oftentimes what happens. One of the, Some of the best recruiters or the best account managers will go off and try to form their own company. Sometimes they're successful at it. Sometimes they aren't. It's a challenge unto itself. Many travelers that try to be, have their own agency, I've told you guys, it's, it's not as easy as it looks. There's a lot of issues that come up that you just don't know about. And you find out the hard way. And that's why we also see those kind of short-lived, where it's the travel, let's say, nurse, for example, agency that turns into you know, something short-lived and they get 20, 30 people and then it, it fizzles out because it's just difficult. But a lot of these new companies come from recruiters wanting more. So here's what I'll tell you guys. It is a simple process. It's a lot of, you know, at the very beginning, it's a lot of cold calling. It's a lot of smiling and downing, as we used to call it. It's a lot of instant message, a lot of, of meme postings on Facebook groups. It's a lot of textings. You're out there gathering as much information trying to acquire you, the commodity, the traveler, to give them some time and to say, okay, I want to hear what you have to say. The challenge then for a recruiter becomes, what does my company back me with? In other words, am I going to make a whole lot of money, but I have a thin margin, so it's more about getting, you know, convincing people who maybe are unaware of what they could be making to go to work for us so we can make a lot and I can make a lot as a recruiter. That's a real model, and there's nothing wrong with it. It just means that they're going to make more money off of you individually, but their job is going to be more difficult because it's clearly selling from an inferior uh, compensation package, which means they're going to have to really be good at convincing you not to look at anything else. And that's, again, that's not for me to judge one way or the other. It just means that's their challenge. I would hope that any company who has the thinnest 
pay rates or the thickest margins out there, in other words, that they're keeping more of it, they're offering or, or having the recruiters sell a more difficult package, which would mean, again, same bill rate as everyone else has, but they're going to take more of it, which means their rat recruiter's job is more difficult. I would certainly hope that recruiter would make more money if their compensation plan works. I would hate to be a recruiter that you know, offers less than anybody else and also doesn't make very much as anybody else. That would be a terrible job and one that I would definitely be leaving and going to work for another company that has one or the other. I mean, it doesn't, you know, again, depending upon your sales style. So again, you guys can't be upset about that. But here's what I'll tell you. You guys know this. How long has it been? Your favorite recruiter out there right now, have you had him or her for a very long time? Has it changed? Have they changed companies? Have they, you know, and you, and you followed them? Are they relatively new? For a lot of you, you guys have had a recruiter and all of a sudden, Boom, out of the blue, hey, I want to let you know your recruiter has moved on to greener pastures and now we're going to assign you to this recruiter and you may or may not like that recruiter more or less. It's the revolving door. It is difficult to be a successful recruiter in our industry. always has been. And I think as we move into the next five to six years, I think it's going to be even more and more difficult, which is why if you are a recruiter out there and you love this industry, I would urge, urge, urge you to switch to another part of the industry, whether it be account management or finance or, or anything. But being a recruiter, I think, is going to become more and more difficult, especially if you're unfortunate enough to work for a company that has a thick margin and offers their travelers less. It's just going to be it's just the case, and you should recognize that and decide to do something about it if you love this industry. So... Here, here's, here's what I want to say. Everybody is new at their job the first time they take it, right? I mean, every, no one, at the beginning of no matter what career you have, you have a learning curve, like I just said. For you guys as travelers and healthcare providers, you guys know this, and your facility or where you're working or your resume merits getting help, assistance, not being thrown to the wolves, hopefully, for the most part. We are dealing with lives that's, and so that sort of thing, so you guys are lucky that you didn't just have to come out and, and just fake it till you make it, as they say. With recruiting, it's not so much the case. Recruiting, listen, most CEOs and most sales directors and recruiting managers don't care. They don't say, oh, if he's a brand new recruiter, I'm not going to let him or her take a eight-year veteran traveler with 20 years of experience. I mean, they're going to, if you got them, you've earned them, they're your, they're your commodity, they're your traveler. Now, the leads may be given out that way. Different companies are going to hierarchy their leads. They're going to hierarchy how they hand out and, and reward a more veteran recruiter over a, over a brand you know newbie recruiter. But for the most part, a pretty good sweeping statement is that if you have secured a traveler as a new recruiter, that's going to be your traveler. They're not going to take that person away from you just because you're brand new. So for those of you veteran travelers out there, you may have found yourself linked up to somebody that's been doing this position or been advising travelers for just a couple of months or maybe less than a year while you're a you know an eight-year traveler and 20-year experience. It's going to be interesting to see how that relationship fizzles out or develops. Again, you're going to either help them get good. And again, I'll say this multiple times during this episode, you can get lucky and have a new recruiter. Please hear this, all you recruiters out there. That's That actually has a very fast learning curve and gets to the process quickly. There's nothing wrong with that, and I, I hope that you do. That means you're going to become a great recruiter. That means you as a traveler have a good experience and good chance of having some success with a recruiter, albeit that they're brand new. But more often than not, you guys understand this, the simple logistics behind this. That's probably not going to be the case. You're going to struggle with somebody who's brand new. They're going to miss things and ill-advise you on things that you should be taking that you, they forgot about. They might be unorganized or they're not going to advise you on things that you had no idea about because they won't know enough about you the areas you flow to, the licensures you may or may not have, and all the different certifications that allow you to have a position, or they might waste your time putting in front of something that you have no ability to get and, and garner or secure that position, if that all makes sense. So here's what I say. With a recruiter regardless, you guys as travelers are oftentimes putting your career in the hands of a or a handful of people that you're hoping will give you, get this, good career advice. How scary would it be to know that the person that's giving you this career advice may literally have been doing this for a couple of months and barely understands the industry at all? You're going to be surprised at how many recruiters you guys talk to when you're just calling a, uh, an agency out of the blue because you heard good things about them or you're just looking or you, you respond to a, a Facebook meme that has a pay rate that, that sounds attractive in a location that makes sense to you. You'll be surprised how the chances of them being relatively new or an average recruiter, how high that is. It's pretty darn high. And again, you guys are going to get career advice from that recruiter, which is, <laughs> to me, kind of crazy, always has been, right? 
So here's why recruiting is a, is a revolving door. Let me just break this down for you and say it as simplistic as I can. It's a revolving door because it is a sales position. And people get upset when I say that. But prove me wrong. It is a sales position that's been called recruiting. You guys know what Army and Navy and Air Force and Marine recruiters are. They're trying to convince someone to basically put their life on the line for our country and, and who knows where they're going to go. And talk about a tough sales job. It is a sales job. Recruiting means selling. It's just kind of hidden in an area where there, it sounds like recruiting means they're helping the facility. Typically in our world, it means they're helping the agency, but it doesn't typically mean they're helping you. If you look at what the word recruiter means, they're recruiting you for one other entity. And in our industry, I'll tell you, that's mostly the agency side, right? So it is selling you. Again, I mean, how many times I have to do this, but I'm gonna do it again. It probably makes some of you guys like, oh God, here he goes again. I'm gonna go again anyway. <laughs> there are, for the most part, if I have a position, I'm telling you, 200, maybe 150 companies have the exact same position being offered to them at the exact same bill rate that me and my company are getting it for. There's no two ways around that. Now, there are some big, big companies that have some exclusives on that. There's some bigger companies that only have a handful, and if they're not fulfilling, they'll go to some other companies like we're seeing now. But it's a pretty good rule of thumb that a good guess is that if you're working with a, you know, I, I can't make you give examples, but if you are looking at a position somewhere in the country, and you've seen that before with multiple agencies, there are literally over probably 100 companies easily that have that exact same position. So think about how crazy our industry is. Now you're going to try to go through and try to figure out how close to high pay can I get based upon what? I know there are some great websites out there right now that are doing some good comparison. I think that's a healthy thing for industry. I think it's going to hurt a lot of thick margin companies that, that you know take too much of the piece of the pie, as, as I've always stated. But it's still difficult because they're only dealing with a handful of companies. There's a ton of other companies that aren't even on their list, which might be paying way more than those companies are. They charge those companies money to be to play in their bill. It's not a free thing. It's another part of the pie. It's another operating expense that somehow will end up eventually going into the traveler's cost because that agency is paying a ton of money to be listed as part of those companies. So it's, it's just a wrinkle, but I do like them. I think they are helpful for you, the traveler. But I think in the long run, they you know keep your rate low, which is not really helping and not really moving our the the industry forward to having it be a little bit more travel friendly it's actually keeping it from that so you guys are comparing agencies and only a handful and those agencies are paying top dollar to be listed and to be put on those websites when there's literally hundreds of companies that might be paying more than just that handful of agencies that you're going to those sites for understand that it's not it's not a perfect scenario but it does at least help you compare whatever companies are paying that website to compare but it really eliminates everybody else. So do understand that. It's just, it's just one of those things. It's it's both good, but also not helpful in the long run, which, again, it's just another one of those things, hey, how can we make money on the industry without getting involved or having to float payroll, put out millions of dollars in payroll or waiting to get paid? It's another way to figure out how to tap into the wonderfully lucrative business of healthcare staffing without having to actually be the agency, which everyone's trying to figure that out. Are, are they not? So it's a salesperson job. That's why it's a revolving door. It is the most expensive part of an agency's operating costs, typically. Now, I you could have some agents out there say, oh, no, ours, you know, they may spend millions and millions of dollars on advertising. Don't see that a lot because it's such a niche industry that it really doesn't make sense to advertise like crazy uh, to, to gain people. Back when there was magazines that were part of healthcare travel, believe it or not, people would get the front cover, the back cover, the inside cover, and they'd pay a lot of money to be, you know, get that top of mind awareness for that. Nowadays, the advertising is more about branding. So there really isn't, as you guys could probably attest to, there's not really a lot of advertising except for things that are, people are paying for, like on Twitter or on, on you know, a podcast if we were sponsored, which we're not. On TikTok, Facebook, there's ads and money that's put out there. But it'd be weird for me to think that someone is spending more money on that than they are on their incredibly expensive internal sales team, which is also known as recruiters. First of all, there's salaries. Let's talk about that for a second. 
as you guys know, um, I can only speak for where I was. I was in one of the higher cost of living places when I, when I had recruiters, which was in Denver, and we had to pay forty thousand dollars minimum salary, and that was you know five years ago before inflation really took over. I can't imagine trying to recruit, to attract somebody to be a recruiter for less than a fifty thousand dollar base in Denver. I do understand in some parts of the country it's cheaper. Out here in California, it would probably be even a little bit higher or comparable to that. Then you've got your, you know, your your training cost. You've got, you know, the the your, their orientation cost. So you've got your your salary. You've got your benefits if they're taking insurance, dental, medical, vision. That's all part of, you know, that cost. As and it's and say it's, it's an operating expense. It doesn't matter if they have zero travelers or two hundred travelers working for them. That cost is still there. The commission is really a cost of goods sold, but most places keep it as an operating expense. But it really is a cost of goods sold. In other words, that amount that they're making off of you weekly or hourly, or however their commission plan is set up, that's a sliding scale. But it does come out of the company's bottom line, whether it's on the top end and the cost of goods sold, or not the bottom end on operating expenses. It's not going to make it all the way to the bottom. It's going to be an expense, whether I can say it's a cost, it's a cog, or it's going to be an OE. So those are going to come out, which is why companies' margins are going higher and higher. The higher commission plan, the more that person costs the company, which means... It's again, it's the most expensive part of our business model. If you look at me, and they, yeah, we can, especially if you're if you're of any size. If you're smaller, I could see maybe some things being a little higher. Like if you were a little tiny company, you might have higher, you know, insurance costs because you aren't there yet. But any company of size, that's where the majority of their expense goes. You know, after the top line, when you talk about internal expenses, it's that salary. How many times have I said, if you guys look at any of these TikToks or any of these Twitters where everyone's like, hey, everybody is standing up on a, on a step ladder in a corner of the room and said, everybody stand up out of your cubicle and say hi and wish everyone happy Nurses Week or say hi, it's 4th of July. And the whole group you know, stands up and you're looking at every one of those cubicles is costing base without commission somewhere probably close to fifty to sixty thousand dollars per little six foot by six foot square and there's hundreds of those sometimes in those places or a hundred of them so do the math on that and then you throw in the commission cost some of you are making good six figure incomes and i'll talk about that here in a second some certainly aren't but that is the biggest expense in our industry and there it comes out of somewhere well let me say it this way if it's not there the margin doesn't have to be as big because that's what you're you, that's what you're getting that margin for to you know to pay all those people. It's coming out of the bill rate, which means for every travel you know travel healthcare provider that's out there working it, that piece of that pie and that company's margin we talked about in episode number twenty six, which was called you know the pie. The bigger that is, it's a lot of times because they have a bigger and bigger sales team. When a company grows, they're going to say, okay, what's the first thing we're going to do? The first thing I do is well, we need to hire some more recruiters because we can't just rest on our laurels. These recruiters are only you know able to handle so many travelers. We can only count on them for so many travelers, which I'll talk about here in a second. So the first thing they do is they start adding more recruiters, big, getting bigger office space, adding software for every cubicle that's there, adding phone lines, adding Wi-Fi lines, adding all the different things that go into that cube. And that's how the company grows to get the number of size. Now, it's an economic of scale, which means they don't have to you know, you're, you're hoping that you, for every recruiter in, you're going to bring in two, three, four, five, ten times the amount of revenue that the recruiter costs. But as I'll tell you in a second, as I'll, I'll mention in a second, it doesn't always happen. And matter of fact, it rarely does. That's why there's such a revolving door. So follow me on this. Every recruiter that's hired, any CFO, CEO, recruiting manager, vice president knows this is exactly based upon our office space and all the different things I just mentioned, the amount that it costs to basically put a butt in that chair, in that cubicle, and it should be broken down that much. How much is the phone? How much is the software we have to license? Or how much do we have to develop our own if it's our own internal software? Every little penny that goes into the hiring of that recruiter, brand new, training, the benefits, all the things we're talking about, there is a break-even point in which that recruiter needs to get to in order to justify their place in that, in that company. If they're below that, they're on the hot seat, which means they're not bringing in as much revenue as they're costing the company. That's a very bad thing. Then they're, okay, finally they're at that break-even point. And then you've got the, the superstars that bring in a whole bunch more revenue than what they actually cost, including their crazy, wonderful commission that they make. They justify it by far. By the way, when they start realizing how the disparagement between those two, between those two is, 
that's when they say, hey, I want to start my own company. And then they, then they realize how hard that is. But that's what happens, right? And that's why there's such a revolving door. But so here's what's kind of interesting. If you look at any sales team, recruiting is no different. And here's some real kind of shocking things you'll, you'll see in our industry currently. About 25% of the, the sales team at that office, whatever that company it is, about 25%, one-fourth of those people generate about 50% of the revenue for that company. They're the superstars. Now, we could break it down any further. Trust me, they're about the top 10% bring in a huge amount, and then it goes from there. But on any given recruiting team, again, sweeping statements, so all you VPs and CEOs out there listening to me, I'm sure yours is higher and more diversified. I get it, but the average. That's what it looks like. They are generating half the revenue because they've made it. They found their place. They're justifying their seat. And they've gotten past that learning curve where they're actually pulling in more money. And again, I hope if you guys find a new recruiter, I hope that you've got somebody that learns fast and they're actually doing a good job because they won't stay there long if they're not. Here's some of the bad news. <laughs> it's crazy because about 50% of the rest of the team are kind of there making it. They're, they're either right below or slightly higher. Yeah, they're not going to get fired, but and they're not costing the company money, but the, the people that are in charge of them, whether it's, a, like I say, a recruiting manager, are certainly doing what they can to try to pull them into a higher revenue where they're making more money. They're dangling better commission plans in front of them, or they're hoping they're making it, but they're not costing the company money. They don't need to necessarily be fired, depending upon the company, but they're not the superstars. They're bringing in revenue and their place is safe. But by the way, they're not making crazy amounts of money. A lot of you people think that the average recruiter makes a ton of money. No, the average recruiter doesn't make a ton of money because the average recruiter doesn't actually make it as a recruiter. And you got 25% of the people that are there that are so brand new that they're not actually even generating and making their, their seat available. And that's the idea. They, they're on a time clock. They are on a absolute, you know, depending upon the company, regardless of what their model is, if they don't get to a certain break-even point by a certain time, whatever that company feels is appropriate, they won't stay there. Any company worth their weight will say, see you later. You're not making it. we got to let you go because we're paying more than you're generating in revenue. And believe it or not, that's about 25% all the time. You're constantly got brand new people, which, of course, they have nobody when they come on board unless you're stealing them from somebody else and they're unethically bringing people over to that company, which, by the way, does happen frequently in our industry. Or they're brand new, what we're talking about today, which means they don't have whatever that figure it is. And that figure is going to be very diverse and verify, I'm sorry, and, and, and very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just really diverse across from one company to the other. It just is going to be, depending upon that company's operating expenses and what they have and what they're paying for leads and how they're doing all their information, what kind of money they're spending on their social media. It's all put into that. So it could be five. It could be 30. It really depends upon your company. But trust me, I think the bigger the company, the more they're expecting you to maintain. That's kind of a good rule of thumb. So in other words, they're on the hot seat. So what I just said is literally, if you look at what I just mentioned, you've got a 75% chance that whoever you're working with right now on an industry standard is either not making it or kind of barely making it as a recruiter. They are not the creme de la creme. Now, again, it can go up close to that, closer to that 25%. It really depends upon where you are. But what I'm saying is the chances are really strong that whoever you just called and said, I, this XYZ company, I want to work with them, you're either getting a brand new recruiter or you're getting someone who hasn't been there very long that's barely making it. And again, you're going to get career advice and you're going to trust that person to put you in front of the jobs that match up perfectly for you. They're going to listen to what you have to say. They're going to be able to change on a dime and add and subtract locations based upon where you can and do and don't want to go. And they're going to be able to move and pivot and prioritize all the things you're expecting them to do like this. And the chances are, no, they're not. They're not going to be able to do that very effectively. It's just the way it is. So, be careful about who you're getting career advice. Start to validate some of this stuff. It's, it's, inc it's incredibly crazy. And when you start talking about a brand new recruiter, remember that everybody's brand new. This industry is not, if you guys will attest to this, tell me if I'm wrong, but how long has your recruiter been there? Ask him or her. See if you can tell that they're, if they're being honest or not. It is not a career that people are at for a very long time unless they just, you know, they're just satisfied with making that kind of money and that's, they never want to make any more. You guys want to make more money. So do recruiters. There's a point where they can't make any more. Like I said, there, there's a finite number of hours in a day. There's a finite number of mechanisms in which that company allows them to, to generate more revenue. The company would love them to generate more money. But it's, there comes to a point where even as hard as they work, if they take their job home to them, they're going to be limited to what they can actually handle on their own, which means eventually 
unless they move into some other realm or tra- you know, a, a management, they're going to get kind of close to being tapped out. And what happens is for many recruiters, they say, I want more. And I would hope in our country, most people want to keep continue to do better. They want to you know, earn that right. And as your time goes by, you should be getting better and better. And you should be more and more compensated if you have that ability. But if you're limited to what you can make in any sales job, you're going to leave. Anybody will, right? Unless it's the cushiest cake job and you just love what you do and money's not important. But this is why it's a revolving door. It's mostly a revolving door because people don't make it. And that's what you guys need to understand. There are a ton of people that get in our industry and they are literally working with you out there right now, probably today. They called you or they're going to call you and they've barely even started working this industry for less than six months, less than a year. I mean, I will tell you as we move in this episode that it takes a long time to get really, really good at recruiting because it's so unique. Every day is so different. You cannot train all the scenarios that a recruiter is going to find themselves in. It just takes time. That learning curve for a recruiter can be very quick when it comes to some nuts and bolts stuff, what specialties are, who, do, who your, your candidates actually you know, can be submitted to, licensure, certifications. You know, does, does, does ICU and, and can, can a MICU float into ICU and vice versa? And you know, why can't a CV ICU nurse, you know, why can't an ICU nurse do that? All these things that they learn really quickly, that's pretty fast. But when it comes to the nuances and becoming really, really good at what they do, unfortunately, that part of the learning curve slows down. It takes a long time. Someone who's been doing this for 10 years knows their stuff. I will tell you that. If they don't, then they've been keeping their heads in the sand. A recruiter has been around for 10 years knows their stuff, but that's kind of a unicorn. Tell me if I'm wrong, because most recruiters that have been here for 10 years want more. And they don't want to keep recruiting because they want to make more money. And they should because they're generating all the revenue for the company or a majority of it. This is why it's such a revolving door. And again, the biggest thing that should scare most of you guys, it's not really a revolving door because of that. What should scare you is it's a revolving door because these people don't aren't good enough to maintain their seat in that agency. Or let's take the people that are kind of barely there that I mentioned that, you know, that that 50% of the people that are kind of okay, but they're they're you know, they're breaking even, but they're not doing that great. Is that who you want to put your career in? <laughs> as as the company gets better and their training gets better, those people, the cream will start rising to the top. And some of those people that have been maintaining that position that are doing okay find themselves in a little bit of hot water saying, how come you're the lowest of the totem pole? And pretty soon they start losing their position or, or being asked to, to step away. It's common. You guys know this. For those of you who have been doing this for any length of time, count the number of times that your recruiter has all of a sudden miraculously been replaced and you've been handed another recruiter it's really common in our industry and it's a tough thing to explain trust me we used to try to tap dance around it whether someone quit or got fired or couldn't make ends meet it was always like oh, okay we're just gonna let them know that, hey they took a better position and we're so happy for them and they fostered their career and they're going somewhere else but right now you got this person now who you don't know who's now going to take over and try to you know instantly know all the things that they thought they knew about you and you've told the other recruiter and they're going to try to fold you in and make it work. And it oftentimes doesn't, does it? So that's where we are. All right, so let's talk about some things. Let's talk about training. Here's the, some of the things we'll all tell you. The better the training that a company has with regards to rec- recruiting, whether it's the, the initial training program that they go through or any continually ongoing training that a company may or may not have, is going to help that recruiter get through that learning curve a little bit better, which means companies that do a better job at that may have some slightly different numbers than what I mentioned earlier. They may have a lot more people that are generating more revenue. They may have less and less people that are that are hurting their bottom line and are actually costing them money, which means you have a chance of getting a better recruiter based upon the company's ability to train and move people through that learning curve quicker. That's just simple facts. Some companies have better retention, right? There are companies that will have a better way of keeping that recruiter who's starting to get slightly dissatisfied because either they they don't have enough positions to sell for, their margins may not be as difficult, it might be more difficult to, to sell you guys, or the income that they're they're generating, the commission plan may need to be tweaked so that they are you know, allowed to stay. Hey, I need now that I've earned the right and I've got this many travelers, I think I need a higher salary, or I think I should have you know more commission based upon this or this. Companies that are good at retention will keep a, a good recruiter around longer, but again, there is a limit to what they are willing to do, and that's why eventually many or most <laughs> recruiters leave recruiting. And and it's very rare that you see someone start in, in recruiting and 35 years later retire as a recruiter. It's, it's, it's almost never heard of, right? And right now someone's going, I know somebody. Well, good, but you don't know... A thousand of them, do you? You might know one or two. It's exactly the point I'm making. That's it's just it's, it's wild. 
So here's what I'll also tell you. Every different company has a internal transparency limit, right? You guys know I'm open to talk about anything in the industry. There's nothing we can't talk about. That's why I can't wait for you guys to join us on TikTok Live by by going to Next Gen at Next Gen Med Staff. Follow us there because we're gonna go live on TikTok. We're gonna be throwing things out there. I want to have travelers on with me. We can have open, candid discussion about good things, about bad things in the industry, and really have a conversation that you've probably never seen before on anything like TikTok. We've got travelers people from our industry, and maybe even some hospital people that can actually get together and have some honest conversations. So join us on that on a side note. But internally, many companies don't share as much as other companies do with their recruiting team. That's just the way it is. Some recruiters literally are flying blind, guys and gals. I will tell you that. They have no idea what the company's margins are. They're being dictated. Here is a price that you can sell this position at because the software will do that math for them. Or even worse, they'll give them a range, and here's where you can sell this the more money you keep with the company, the less money you pay a traveler, the higher your commission is going to be. But we will forbid you to go too low because we don't want to, you know, it's not worth it for us. And we'll forbid you to go too high because we don't want our traveler to be the lowest paid person out there. Or, you know, we don't mind them being one of, we don't want them to be the lowest. So they usually will put a little framework in. But hear that, as I've always said, most commission plans out there involve a recruiter knowing at least the range in which they can offer you a position. And the less they pay you, the more that recruiter will oftentimes get weekly, hourly, based upon the number of hours you work. There'll be some sort of, of reward for them for convincing you to take a job at lower pay. Again, prove me wrong. I, it's the majority of commission plans out there. Some of them are just, here's what it is. I mean, those I think I actually like better. Here's what our commission, here's what you can offer this person, and that's all there is to it. I actually don't like our industry. I think it's, it's really hurt us where a recruiter can literally have two people working at the exact same bill rate, maybe in the same hospital or two different hospitals, and they're paying them two different wages based upon their ability to be able to convince one traveler to blindly go with them at a lower rate pay-wise than another one did. It just stinks. You guys should not have to be negotiators. But unfortunately, as many of you can attest to, you kind of have to be a good negotiator for most companies in this industry, which I think should never be the case. But that's just the way I think. I think it's weird. You're not supposed to be a negotiator or a business person. You're supposed to be a healthcare provider who happens to have a business mindset, right? It just it's it's not good, and unfortunately that's the case. But do hear that. So companies don't always let their recruiters know the numbers, which is one of the biggest problems. When you talk to a recruiter, and as I'll tell you, some of the things to, to look out for, if you're dealing with somebody that doesn't understand a lot of the the numbers that you guys have learned on Travel Evolved and some of the basic fundamental stuff that allows us to figure out bill rates and pay. I'm, not, I'm sorry, figure out pay rates from bill rates. Don't necessarily blame the recruiter because they may just not know or be given that information. It's it's unfair to say or assume, but I will tell you the longer and the more savvy and the more veteran a recruiter is, the likelihood is less. So if you've got a veteran travel, a veteran recruiter has been around for ten years telling you, I don't, I don't know. I doubt it. They wouldn't be as good as they would as they are and last as long if they didn't really understand truly what it is that they're trying to convince you to buy at, and that is the in fact the compensation package. But do know that not all recruiters really have a good idea and understanding of what it is that they're actually asking you to take. Sometimes they have no idea if they're the highest paying, if they're the lowest paying, or anywhere in between because the companies don't want them to know because they don't want them to figure this stuff out so that they, in fact, do say, wow, the company's making a lot of money. I'm only making this much, and I'm doing all the heavy lifting like I talked about earlier. It, it's, it's a weird internal thing that we, we've never really openly talked about in Travel Evolved, but it is there. And it's not for many, not for a lot of companies because people are smart and you can figure it out. But there are a few that they really just, the recruiter has no clue, doesn't even see the bill rate, doesn't even see anything. They see the software says, here's what this job's paying and here's what you can sell it for, either the price or the range. And that's all there is to it, which is unfortunate, I think, but it's it's the real the real fact. All right, so here's some, some things that I think you need to be very aware of when it comes to being new recruiters. One of the first things is that what we're dealing with right now, and I'm going to sneeze, maybe... <laughs> okay, edit that out. <laughs> what we're dealing with right now is a very unique period of time in healthcare travel. It just is. How does a brand new recruiter have any idea how to give you guys, and here it comes again. <clears throat> Boy, I've never done that before on Travel, but I don't think in 102 episodes. How to give you any advice on how to navigate these waters that we're in right now. How can they possibly give you anything to, com you know, to compare it to? How do they have anything to compare it to? And know what's the best thing I can help my traveler do to get through 
maybe a tough time when there's less demand, there's more supply, the rates are low, how can they possibly have any sort of framework in which to to give advice from? The fact is they can't. And when they're brand spanking new, this is where you guys have to be careful. You know, this is where you know way more than a, than a recruiter does. I mean, really think about that for a minute. You get This has been one of the most unique periods of time we've had in healthcare in general. And let's just say that you are unlucky enough that you happen to be have your wagon hitched to somebody that's been doing this for six months, these last six months. And by the way, someone out there or a number of you out there, <laughs> you're dealing with that exact scenario. You just may not know it. Six months. And right now, you're counting that person to be able to get you and submitted to jobs and have all the organization things we're going to talk about here still during this wild, crazy time. I mean, this is if it's not rearing its ugly head more now, if you don't see what I'm talking about, about the dangers of working with someone brand new and you don't know if they're brand new or not, this should be it. You guys may be experiencing it. You're scratching your head going, I can't figure out why this isn't happening. Well, that's not happening. Well, it could be because you're dealing with someone on the end of the line that you are counting on to help you advance your career, your income, your livelihood, and you're, you're basing on somebody that you don't even really know who you're hoping has been around long enough that has some good insight as to what's the best thing to be doing right now during this crazy period of time. And it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy, but this is no other period of time before this. Right now, you're probably seeing a lot of exactly what it is I'm talking about because there's some things out there that aren't making sense, and I can't imagine trying to teach a recruiting team or someone who's been around six months how to how to help travelers right now. It, it would almost be like I'd give up and say, I don't know, just do your best you can, kid, and let's see what happens. I mean, it's, it's almost to that point right now. It would be ridiculous. So there's that. I mean, listen, a, a new recruiter doesn't understand the way you guys tick, what makes you think, what makes you move. Here's how recruiters basically work. They basically... <laughs> are there to organize their own day based upon the chances, and I want you guys to hear this, of who can make me the most money, by I mean who, I'm talking about you guys. What traveler out there has the ability to make me the most money and or the fastest? In other words, who's the most placeable, who has the highest you know, commission based upon probably the higher bill rate? In other words, a, a cath lab RN is going to generate more commission than a CNA. I'm sorry, it just is. It's just the way it goes. Right, a, a physical therapist is going to generate more revenue than a phlebotomist. It just is the way it is. I'm just throwing it out there. So understand that if you are in a situation where you are generating less revenue because your bill rate and hopefully, and I would imagine your pay rate is lower, you're going to be lower on the priority list. And the recruiter is going to be putting people above you all day long. There's just no two ways around that. I am sorry to be the one to tell you that, but it's the facts. I mean, a recruiter's gonna have to work twice. You have to have two people, right? Two people, maybe in that lower category, to make the same kind of commission as one. It probably even less. It's probably more than two in most scenarios. It's all about the bill rate and how their commission plan is structured. So recruiters trying to figure out who has the most traveler marketability, who is the most open, who has maybe the most naive that I can close faster, and that's how they're judging the back of their mind all day. Now, maybe not openly, but the fact is that's what they're thinking, whether they can recognize it or not subconsciously. I need to make money. What's my best chance of making money? And by the way, if I'm going to make money, I'm going to put the effort in. Who can I make the most money with? And that's what they're doing all day long. So it's, 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 it's remarkable to me that, that they're now trying to figure out what makes you guys tick, and they're trying to understand things that you guys know more than they do. For example, here's why it takes a long time for a recruiter, a new recruiter, to understand travel. If you think about, I mean, you guys have been in healthcare for probably a long time, so understand this is all coming from somebody that's, that's outside of, of your business. If you're allied, and let's just say you're in imaging, I mean, to be honest with you, that's a pretty complicated world if you don't live in it. You don't understand what what's the difference between a rad tech and what's the difference between an X-ray tech. What's the difference? Why? How? Who's? What's a? What is a? You know? What's a cath lab tech? As opposed to an RN, what do they do along? What do they do during that procedure? What's a nuclear med tech for crying out loud? Unfortunately, I know very well what a nuclear med tech does. Well, you know, these are all simplistic things to those of you that are in the imaging field. But for someone who's going to about ready to give you career advice, it is not, it's complicated. They don't understand 
at the very beginning, the difference is the machines you guys use. The ability to be able to kind of do multiple different types of imaging, whether you're, you know, what is it is it all encompassing as a rad tech or is it specifically an MRI tech? They don't they don't really understand the difference of that at the very beginning. And maybe you guys are kind of going, oh, I kinda of understand that now. It takes some time. So remember, until they really have it down, they don't necessarily know what jobs to put you in front of. Or they may, and you guys may have experienced this, they may put you in front of a job that you said, I can't do that. That's not what I do. <laughs> it, it's, it's remarkable. Going to nursing. I mean, again, I've had new recruiters try to put a CV ICU, I should say an ICU nurse in front of a CV ICU position. Very common. Or they'll skip and say, well, I didn't know that an ICU nurse could do medical ICU or surgical ICU. I didn't know that SICU was something totally different. Again, things that want to put your head in through the wall because you just realize that your recruiter for who knows how long wasn't connecting the dots and just missed the opportunity for not only, your, you know, I was thinking about for company, but for you guys on the receiving end, they missed all that opportunity for you. They were not being considered for jobs you should have been considered. And sometimes you're being considered for jobs that are just a waste of your time, whether it's licensure, certification, you know, floating, all the different things we, we talk about. It's, it's, it's insane how, how all that kind of stuff works. I've had recruiters who would repeatedly put, let's say, a respiratory therapist in front of a position that was very pediatric specific or only for pediatrics. And, and the, 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 the RRT had zero experience with peds, had no interest in working with peds. The recruiter kept seeing respiratory therapy and wasn't looking at the details. These are common things that happen behind the scenes that you guys don't understand. Why new recruiters are difficult. Yes, training can fix this stuff. But at the very beginning, this stuff is all very, very complicated to a recruiter. And it just doesn't seem like it should be, but it is. So they're trying to figure out job requirements. They're looking at their software. And of course, they've got things that match them up. And it all has to do with, you know, they input it right. Did they put in there that a telemetry nurse may or may not be able to do PCU, may be able to you know, do you know, a critical care situation in a, in a very low acuity level three hospital, that there really is no ICU there. All these little wrinkles, they may not be doing you the right service. And again, you're counting on them to not miss a job for the, you know, and, and they may, wait, wow, they may have walked by three of them or let three of them go by in the exact location you want to go in for a really great pair because they didn't think you were qualified. Again, new recruiters, right? I forget, I had a VP of a company one time. I did something, like, oh, that's crazy. You're trying to make me feel bad because I was beating up on new recruiters. I'm not beating up. It's just a simple fact that, that you guys should be open to the idea that this isn't great. I don't have a solution for it besides going with, of course, a recruiterless company that doesn't use them and working with app where you're your own recruiter. But I don't. I didn't have a solution back then as to what you should do. I just was pointing out the fact that you have to be careful and be aware that you might be dealing with a brand new recruiter. We have options now. You guys don't even need recruiters anymore, and you guys are going to learn that a lot over the next few years. But it's interesting to me that many people don't think about this because no one from my side of the desk wants to openly talk about the fact that you might be putting your hands and chances are strong in into someone's onto someone's in the desk that doesn't have the ability to do a great job for you and you do it with three or four people because it's a pain in the you know what to send in your paperwork to companies and now you've got latched up with somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience and you're hoping that they're going to find you a job. Meanwhile, they're missing stuff that they should be submitting you to when you guys change your minds. I mean, that's the other part about it. So organization is the other big thing that's really important to recruiters. A good recruiter is highly organized. Yes, they have software that allows them to be more organized than what, than what is humanly possible, which is wonderful. It's a good, it was a good addition to our industry many, many years ago when we had different software systems that would you know you'd put in Here's my cath lab tech, and here's where he or she wants to go, and here's where they're licensed, and every job that would come through, they would get a notification. But they still have to prioritize that. They can't just send out everything instantly as it comes in, like an app can. They have to still say, okay, I'm either going to text or I'm going to phone call, depending on how long we're talking about. Some of it's pretty quick, but it still is dependent upon them putting in the information to make sure that those alarms and those notifications come to them, that they see that job, that they did it right, that they aren't putting cath lab RN positions in for that poor person and, and then telling about a job they have that, oh, never mind, that's for an RN, that kind of thing. It's, it's unfair, it's unfortunate, but it's part of the problem with learning a job on the fly, which is what a lot of recruiters are, are you know, they have to do. They don't, there's no really other choices, right? It takes years and years and years to truly get everything. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about, we start talking about, and we haven't even yet, but let's, let's jump into it. Let's start talking about the numbers. Let's talk about tax advantage. Let's talk about 
properly paying people hours 36 to 40? How does on call work? How does call back work? You know, what, what are the rules on holiday and all the different nuances? You start throwing those kinds of things into a recruiter, it, is, it becomes a long period of time until they really have fine tuned their craft, understand it to a level that I think many of you people that have been watching 102 episodes now get. I'm telling you, you guys have more knowledge than probably 90% of most recruiters out there when it comes to stuff like this. It doesn't mean. I'm not telling recruiters that you're, you guys are smarter than, you know, only 10% of them are as smart as you guys or anything like that. So don't have recruiters call me and everything. I'm saying you guys probably know more about, you know, the number side of the industry, which I told you one of the most important commitments you can make if you've watched 102 episodes of Travel Evolved than probably 90% of most recruiters out there. There may be a son that have been doing this for 10, 15 years that still know more because we haven't gotten there or maybe you haven't watched all the episodes, but you probably know more than 90% of recruiters when it comes to the proper ways to be paid, how billing works, how margins are calculated, how taxes work, how tax advantage work. These recruiters don't understand us. When you're brand new, there is no way you can learn all of this in six months Months, sometimes even a year. It takes time, which is why a new recruiter is, can be a problem for you guys. I mean, again, I don't want to sugarcoat this, and clearly, I'm clearly not. It is just the way it is. It is hard to tell if you're working for and one of these people or not. So let's talk about that for a minute. How do you guys know? We'll kind of wrap up the episode, and I'll, I'll move into this section here because I don't want this to go too long because I think you guys get the gist of it. It's dangerous. So how do you know? If you're working with a brand new recruiter, how can you tell? And how can you, you know, if you find out, ask to be moved into someone with a little bit more experience, in my opinion, or completely skip that cycle and go work for a great company that doesn't even have recruiters and you can recruit yourself because you got all the information on an app that you need that a recruiter can tell you and you're not paying them that chunk of that pie that could go to you instead. And I digress. <laughs> I have to get it in. First of all, start talking about things like pay. If you guys have put any investment at all into Travel Evolve, and I hope you have, you, you will know. Trust what you know. Start asking the questions that seem should be to you guys now, like second nature. Ask them about how they're paying for hours 36 to 40. Ask them why they're not giving you that stipend divided by the number of hours you're working to get an hourly amount and taxing you on all of it. Why, why aren't you doing that? Why, why are you keeping that money even if it's taxed? I want it taxed, but that's my money. It shouldn't be a bigger, you know, and again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to go back and listen. For those of you that have been following me from day one or at least caught up and are here now, you will know more, like I just said. Start asking questions that will make it very obvious that this recruiter is brand new. You guys have that tool now. This is why you've done all this. This is why I've asked you guys to go and start from episode one to now. You're starting to see why I think the way that I do. I want you guys to have the empowerment to start to get this industry lifted up to now what is your level. You guys understand more than most recruiters do now. So start whittling away and start separating the ones that know what they're talking about from the ones that don't. I hate to do it, but you guys do not want to get linked up with somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. That's what new recruiting basically is. That's what new recruiters are. Start asking about floating policy. Start asking, you know, how do you, you know, how do you handle that? What if the, if, if the, you know, the, the house manager, the house supervisor is asking me to go someplace I don't know. What is your policy? If they don't even know what you're talking about, well, you're in a lot of trouble. You can have, ask contract specific things like time off. You know, pay. Uh, you know, not paid vacation, but but uh, requested days off. How does that work? How does extensions work? Start talking about tax advantage. Tell me if I go here, how does that work? If they don't know what you're talking about, then you're in trouble, and you've got to get a recruiter with more experience. All these different tools are going to show you what you need to know, and what you are hearing, which are going to tell you everything you need to know about whether or not your recruiter has any experience. And I hope the first part of this episode made you guys realize how vitally important it is that you do your best not to get in front of one of those. Now, again, I'm not trying to <laughs> there's, listen. We don't we don't have 100 percent of the travel healthcare world watching travel evolve, but you guys need to be better than everybody else, which means stay away from new recruiters. They're just for the most part. It'd be a needle in a haystack to find one that actually can really help you. You guys know more than they do. So either get away from them entirely and start using a company. It doesn't have to be ours, but a company that's using an app because you know more, you don't need them, get paid more and stay away or figure out that you're working with a recruiter and ask to be moved with someone with more experience. It's just way too dangerous. Here's how recruiters remember. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll go back to this. A recruiter is spending their day prioritizing and organizing. A new recruiter is also spending a lot of his or her time going out and attracting, like I've said before, the new meat. You guys are the meat. So they're putting memes out there on Facebook, which you guys know drives me crazy. These Facebook groups that all they allow is for memes of a job with, you got to put the job and you got to put this here and you have to have it lined up with this kind of margin. The font has to be this. I mean, it, 
they're going to be gone pretty soon. Those people that run those web pages need to allow other things besides a meme. Otherwise, you're going to lose your 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 audience because that's really ridiculous. It's also very inefficient. I mean, I get pissed because they won't let us go on there because it's like, well, you got you're not putting a meme. I'm like, we don't need a meme. Our meme is every job in the planet instantly. With every every five minutes, you get a brand new position. You want me to sit there and, and post jobs like everybody else that are probably not even there anymore by the time someone reads them? It makes zero sense. So. But that's what these new recruiters have to do. They have to be posting, they have to be texting, they have to be putting things on TikTok, wherever, whatever their avenue is. Lots of calls. They're going through and they're getting, you know, the people that are coming in, they're getting their share of what they are. Maybe that's the, the hot people, maybe it's not. They're spending a lot of their time fishing for people. When they get somebody, they're trying to retain them, but they're spending more of their day trying to get more people. They're certainly trying to book you, but a lot of their day is spent not looking at you, but looking at who else I can get that's like you because I need more money. I can't survive on four people, right? So it's it's a lot of that too. They're always trying to figure out how to get more people on board. On board. So um, <laughs> the recruiting model, like I say, is 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 antiquated. Imagine having somebody not be able to, like, you know, turn on a dime. I mean, how many times you guys have been gone? Let's say, you know, let's say you're on, you're somewhere, and all of a sudden, literally at five o'clock at night, the recruiter's going. Is what I meant to say. You're at five o'clock at night, and all of a sudden, you say, you know what? I think I do. All of a sudden, I change my mind. I talk to one of my friends, and I want to go to, you know, Idaho. But now here it is. You know, well, we're going into a holiday weekend. I know we're going to be posting this thing. I'm pretending it's a holiday. We're going to be posting this thing. I think running around the fourth of July. If that was the case, and it was Friday, you might be waiting until the fifth of July until your recruiter even know that you want to go to Idaho. Now you couple that with a brand new recruiter who's, you know, you've got to trust that he or she is putting that in there. And, oh, by the way, I don't want to go to Maine anymore. It's too far away. And all these different moving parts that are so wonderfully you guys. You should have the ability to be able to change your mind and move and ebb and flow based upon supply and demand, the pay rate, the bill rates, comp- competition level, your marketability, and trusting a brand new recruiter with all that information and be able to move as fast as you guys do is insane. It makes no sense. So, you know, here we go. Let's let's kind of wrap this up this way. There is money involved involved when you are dealing with a recruiter. Period. Like I said, change my mind. You can't you can't change that. This is and always will be an interesting wrinkle and oftentimes a scary part of being a healthcare traveler is that you know this. You guys know this. And you've gotten used to it and you accept it, which is okay. I understand. It is part of your business model. You have to deal with a human element that you know, and you guys all do, that that person, whether they're really clever at it or they're pretending, at some point you know that if you don't take the job with them, they're going to be disappointed. Am I wrong? Which means when you take the job with them, they're happy because they, they won. They won you and they won the commodity. Again, that's part of the way it's been working forever. But it's scary when you're dealing with somebody that is brand new, that doesn't understand the way you tick, It's doesn't understand who and where you're able to go, the kind of money, the kind of compensation you need, understanding the market, the cost of living in that market, all the things that take a long time to become very savvy at, it becomes very, very difficult. If you're going to continue, and I, by the way, here's what I'll tell you. I, I don't think... How do I want to phrase this? The industry is going to have recruiters in it for a little while still. I I believe that. It's not going to change overnight. I think when it starts happening, it will happen quick. I think the technology will be there that more and more agencies are going to have to, you know, say, wow, we got to completely revamp what we're doing. We can't compete with these agencies that don't have recruiters any longer. Travelers are figuring out that they don't need them. It's just like it's going to happen very similarly to the travel, leisure travel. In other words, travel agents back in the you know 70s and 80s where you booked your whole trip also like speedy came out and they quickly disappeared kicking and screaming because they were making a ton of money it's going to be incredibly similar when the consumer back in those days realized that i don't need to plan my family trip and have somebody book our flight and someone book our hotel and someone book our rental car i have the ability to do it on my own when you guys realize that more and more and you realize that you can be paid more because of of you doing that work 
And it's not even work, right? It's you actually working for yourself, knowing those changes, those nuances that you want to go to Idaho and you no longer want to go to Maine, that this job isn't paying enough because you've done the research and you know the cost of living is too high. This job does fit the bill, so I'm going to submit there. When you're able to take that part on and recognize that it is necessary and important, this will all make more sense to you guys. And it's coming. In the meantime, I think a lot of people are going to continue to work with recruiters. I think that's okay. But as companies and people figure out ways to give you more money without having to use that model, you're going to start moving toward them. I don't know why you wouldn't. Tell me why you wouldn't. Because at the end of the day, you guys want to make more money. If it was $200 more a week or $10,000 more a year because you found your own assignment four times and you would be able to do it by clicking a button and having a notification come to you without actually having to do any work, <laughs> wouldn't that make more sense? And it does. So getting back to this for today in the meantime please do yourself a favor please check to see if you're working with someone with very little experience and I, again i hate to throw them under the bus everyone has to learn one way or the other but for those you know percentage of you that are watching travel evolve let the other let the other percentage work with them there's plenty of business for them there's plenty of of you know travelers that are going to go work with a recruiter without thinking about it and they're going to make they're going to be fine if they're going to make it work for them and they're going to make that cut they're going to make it whether or not you guys are watching travel level all or not but you guys do yourself a favor and check to see if you're going to put your eggs in that basket make sure that basket has the best ability to actually do a good job for you and unfortunately the chances of a brand new recruiter being able to do that is pretty slim and tell me i'm wrong doesn't mean they're bad people doesn't mean i'm not pulling for them but for you guys, you don't have that kind of time. You, don't, you can't afford to miss that kind of opportunity by putting your eggs in a basket of someone that just doesn't understand what they're doing yet. Unfortunately, you deserve better than that, and there's no two ways around it. I can't help those people. I wish I had a magic bullet to teach them, you know, a training program they could go through so they could do a better job for you guys. And I hope their agencies do. But you deserve better. If you're not getting what you're, what you're liking from your recruiter, it could very well be that you're dealing with a new recruiter. And I'm sorry, but you're going to have to do better. You, were, you earned that. You, you were owed that. And unfortunately, you're going to have to go out and find it and probably learn that on your own. Whew. There's no way he's around. I can't, I can't change what the, what the episode was. So I'm glad we got it out of the way. Ah, it's one of those things. I mean, I, I just I feel bad. You guys know I do. I feel bad talking about it, but... You guys are my friends. You guys are the, 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 the percentage of people that listen to us, and you deserve to understand the full truth. And like I said, nothing as uncomfortable as to talk about and as tough as it is to tell you not to work for new recruiters. I'm sure there's some really good young kids out there that would love to have your business. I get it. I'm sorry. But we're going to keep everything on the table, as we always do here at Travel Evolved. And on that note... Join us on TikTok, travel at, at travel. I'm oh, sorry, at Next Gen Med Staff. Follow us on YouTube, on our channels. Subscribe to this podcast. Join the Travel Evolve Facebook group so you can catch us live every Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. here on, on the coast. And guys, I will catch you next time on Travel Evolved.